relationship. Yeah. Kopakuma Wafa. Sorry. <laughs> Gopakuma, I, I thought I interpreted. Go, Gopakuma Wafa in Bayern. <laughs> okay. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the chance for me to speak here at last. I think it's just because of my last name, it's starting with Z. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. So. Today, I'm going to tell you a story about a curve counting invariant, which is called the Gopakuma Wafa invariant. So, you may have heard of the Gromov Witten invariant, but not heard of this invariant. But this invariant is actually a very interesting invariant to study. So, first, let me just state the largest conjecture uh, be behind this invariant, which is proposed by these two physicists called the Gopakuma Wafa conjecture. So, it just tells you that. So for x a clavial threefold, and you have a, a, this kind of equation when summing over all g greater than or equal to zero and all beta inside the curve class of the Gromov-Witten invariant of beta, of g and beta, of q to the beta and uh, lambda to the 2g minus 2, is equal to some kind of new invariant they have already described. They call the, of course, they didn't call it the Gopakuma Wafa invariant, but uh, we call them the Gopakuma Wafa invariant, which is n of g of beta and 1 over k of uh, sine of k lambda over 2 to the power of 2g minus 2 and q to the k beta. Uh, if I'm not writing this wrong, then it should be the correct answer. K is greater than or equal to 1. OK. So why do we need to care about this invariant? As you may know, that the Gromov-Witten invariant uh, may be something like rational number. But now the gopakuma wafa invariant, surprisingly, they are all integers. And they uh, also enjoy the more enumerative counting properties like you can extract the 27 lines on the cubic surface by the Gopakuma Wafa invariant. But of course, I will not talk about that today because I'm now counting only on the case of local P2. So this is also a physicist's name, which is actually the total space of O P2 negative 3. OK? So uh, let me just start describing what uh, how they define this invariant. So just in a very intuitive way. So suppose you uh, need to count some kind of curve inside your Carbial threefold. Let's say there's only one curve here. So there's only a genus G curve here, and I modulate my space of curve is only one point. Uh, can everyone see that? See here? Probably no. To write it elsewhere. Okay. So let's say this one is our moduli space of curve, which is too trivial to be considered in this conference. And then <laughs> now we consider the Jacobian associated to this curve, or what the physicists call the D brains, like supported on this curve. And actually, this will give us a torus of T2G. So, how do we count the number of curves? Well, we can count the number of points. Or we can count the number of Jacobians. But how can we count the number of Jacobians is to consider the Poincare polynomial of this kind of Jacobian. And we already know the Poincare polynomial of torus, right? So it's 1 plus 2t plus or 2y plus y squared to the power g. 
So this is a pancreate polynomial of the T2G torus. OK, so uh, I can now define what I mean by the Govakuma Vasa invariant, but only the semi definition, because actually this definition lacks many, many conditions that I have omitted, because it will involve uh, something like perverse sheaf or perverse cohomology. But now I'll just give you a very, very simple definition. But the actual definition you can see on uh, Molik and Toda's paper. It's, the title is just Gopakuma Wafa Invariant via Vanishing Cycle, like 16, I believe. So, uh, so this is my definition, where f is a mapping from m to b. And now you can define what is a Gopakuma Wafa Invariant by the following equation. So it's negative to the power dimension b summation of chi of r i plus. So let me just first define uh, big D equals to dimension of M minus dimension of B. And now Ri plus D of pi star of C of M, uh, Y to the power I equals to, so on the right hand side, there are our Gopakuma Vata invariant, or G sum over greater than zero of Y a half plus Y negative a half to the power 2G. So as you can see here, I have shifted my complex by the dimension just to make sure that the Pancre duality is just y sense to y inverse. So this will make our life easier by just looking at this kind of Pancre duality instead of looking at y to the power dimension minus something. Okay. So on the right hand side, I have shifted. So as well on the left hand side, I have shifted some dimension, so that, that's why we are have negative 1 to the dimension b, because when you shift a, a complex the Euler characteristic will be multiplied by some negative number. All right, so this is my definition of Gopakuma Vasa you learned. So okay. the, the CM is the triple uh, Yeah, so it's just a, a constant sheaf on M. So now our M and B are all smooth variety. So uh, I define this like this because then our decomposition theorem will work very smoothly. Otherwise, I'll try to define the decomposition theorem on many of the things, uh, like the critical manifold or something I don't quite understand. <laughs> uh, what are you assuming on the fibers on this? Uh, so the fibers, yes. So actually, the fibers are uh, uh, so what I, uh, what Toda and Molly have said should be something like Kalabiyo. <laughs> so it's just telling you that for any point, there exists a neighborhood such that uh, F inverse, uh, so K, the canonical bundle on the F inverse of the neighborhood will be isomorphic to the constant. Oh, it's not constant, but uh, holomorphic section or holomorphic functions. So this is uh, some kind of hidden assumption I have got, but now I just uh, like forget all these kind of assumptions. And so our definition of the uh, invariant, so this one, N is called the GV type invariant. So not our real invariant, because you cannot just uh, get some random spaces here and there, and then go get so beautiful formula right here. So our GV invariant is actually defined by saying that M is equal to moduli of sheaves uh, supported, let's say M beta sheaves supported on this beta with Euler characteristic equals to 1. So this is our uh, higher space. And the lower space is just the child variety of this beta, OK? So when you define the, so then you can define this kind of pushing forward, and then you can define these numbers. And these numbers and g are just called the GV invariant. So this definition sounds a little bit weird, but I can actually tell you one very, very easy example, which is just P2 with degree 1 curve. 
So for P2, we can consider the moduli space of degree one curve, which is just another P2. And we can also consider the moduli space of sheaves supported on this degree one curve, which is again a P2. So, so for a P2 with only degree one curve, uh, they are, it's just an identity map. So, so we can apply our formula, which just says that oh, the only thing that is non-zero is i equals to zero, but now also d equals to zero, and we also have this shift right here, so that the only thing that is non-zero is chi of p2 equals to three, which means that our Gopha Kuma Vapa invariant for genus one and uh, genus zero and degree one is equal to three. And you can also consider degree two curve and then it's a P phi goes to P phi. And you can uh, ca calculate that NZ2 will be equal to negative six when you see this formula. And it, it perfectly match up with our gromer witten prediction uh, as inside the formula I have already erased. But now this comes uh, a very strange problem because when uh, like M degree goes up like higher than or equal to three, we cannot have a so nice description of our moduli of sheaves. So we are need to use my computation method, which is something I will tell you, like the second biggest topic, it's called the McDonald formula. So what is the McDonald formula? Well, uh, probably most of you or many of you has already known that. It's just telling you the cohomology of some symmetric product of some curve when the curve is, uh, so C is our smooth curve of genus G. And now we consider the symmetric product uh, and you can just ca calculate by uh, counting these uh, classes that is symmetric and it's summation from I, sorry, so here is I, here is K, summing from zero over I over two, and then wedge product of I minus two K of H one of C, if I remember it correctly. So for McDonald formula, there are many ways to prove that, but uh, there is a very, uh, simple way to see it by just looking at the Jacobian. Sorry, oh. um, oh. the there, is beta the curve class? Uh, uh, yeah, so M beta, where beta is the curve class you are considering. So, so it's uh, beta is inside our Carvel threefold. So, it's in the uh, so I, I'm not sure what do you mean by the fiber class? Because our starting point is a Clavier threefold, and we choose a curve class inside the Clavier threefold. Sorry, I'm a little confused with M and X and B. I only see an M and B. Uh-huh. Uh, so X is our starting point. It's a Clavier threefold. Sorry. I may be a little bit rushing here. So we start by an X Clavier threefold, and then we choose a beta inside our curve class. Uh, the second homology is H2 of C, and then we define the moduli of sheaves supported on this uh, class, and that is our M beta. Okay, all right. okay. And of course, we have to assume that the Euler characteristic is one. So B is the Chow variety of this beta. Okay, right. okay. sorry. Uh, it's writing a little bit low, so it's hard for you to see. All right, so now I need to uh, say what is the McDonald formula, which is in my main calculation. And so uh, the natural question to ask, oh, sorry, the first is a, uh, what I promise is a proof of this kind of formula. So suppose D is large enough, I believe it's 2G minus 1. Then the Abel Jacobi map, mapping from the symmetric product of D points going to the Picard group of degree D is a P D minus G phi, uh, bundle. So then you can just push forward the uh, Abel-Jacobi math of the C 
and then, uh, sorry, it's equal to summation of C of negative uh, I, uh, 2K, where K goes from 0 to D minus G. So uh, you, you just calculate the cohomology of P D minus G and then push it forward. And then you can see that, uh, so for P cut D when D is large enough, uh, it will go to our Jacobian, and you already know the cohomology of the Jacobian, which is just wedge product of H1, and then you just combine these two facts together, and you will see the McDonald formula. Okay. So I shouldn't have erased my definition right here, so let's keep it. So here is the McDonald formula proof. So then we are need to see what's going on when we have a family of curves. So it was by uh, Mignorini and Shende that Mignorini and Shende that they have generalized this formula to a family uh, and also Mollick and Yun. To the family of integral curve that we all we will as well have some kind of this property here. So let's say C to B is a family of integral, integral curve. And now we need to generalize to uh, something like the related Hilbert scheme. So let's define C of D to be the related Hilbert scheme that each fiber is uh, this guy, H of I, uh, H, sorry, C, C, B to the D. The Hilbert scheme of D points of, of uh, length D on this curve scheme. And then we can also have this kind of formula right here just by looking at the I's push forward, pi star D, so this means that up math from C of D to B, the push forward will be exactly quite similar to what we have right here, like the uh, bundle structure. So it's R of I minus 2K, pi star J of C. Uh, J is the relative compactified Jacobian like for each uh, point on B, we associate the Jacobian of this curve, and then we can also form the J here, so which they call the relative compactified Jacobian. Yes, K is going from zero to uh, D minus G, I believe. Let me check. Uh, sorry, I over two. Yes. Okay. So now we have these two formula, but why do we need to care about this formula right here? Well, it's just because when uh, our uh, curve is smooth, the moduli of sheaves supported on beta, when you look at the fiber of these kind of moduli of sheaves, it's exactly the Jacobian. So that we can actually use this formula to calculate many of our uh, Gopakuma Vafa invariant right here. So you can see that uh, to describe this module of sheaves is hard, but to, to describe this uh, like a related Hilbert scheme is pretty easy. So let me just show you an example in my very limited time to say um, why this uh, kind of uh, formula is true. So uh, of course in the first glance uh, you have assumed that it's a family of integral curve. But now, uh, for our case, the curve may not be integral. But the miracle is that this formula also holds in many cases. So now let me just show you the example where you can do by hand, uh, even in home. Okay. So now we consider P2 with degree 4 curve. I have just skipped degree 3 because for degree 3, the moduli of sheaves is exactly C1. So this will not like, show the powerfulness of this formula because we already know what is C1. So let's say degree 4 curve. 
which we have a very hard to describe moduli space. So now our uh, Chow ring of degree four curve in P2 is just given by, so we just consider the, all this kind of curve that is of degree four of AX to the power four plus VX to the power three Y plus uh, the plus C to the power four, uh, something to times C to the power four. And then you collect all these kind of possible uh, coefficient in the front, and then you can form this kind of moduli space by just collecting this coefficient. And the number of coefficient is four plus two, choosing two is 15. So then since scaling by a constant is uh, just the same equation, so then you can, uh, you need to subtract by one, so it's a P14 case, so our base space is P14. Now you can calculate uh, what should be the answer of the first Gopakuma Vafa invariant. So in this case, our genus is equal to, by the degree genus formula, over two is equal to three. So then the highest Gopakuma Vafa invariant should be n uh, of four of three. So here, I didn't remember the, uh, so I believe I write down genus first. So genus is three and then four is a degree. So how do we calculate the N three four? Well, if you look at the definition of the formula, which I'll just tell you that it's actually a chi of R, um, R zero of pi star J or pi star m in our case of c. And then uh, by this kind of McDonald formula, you can just plug in d equals to zero in this formula and see that r zero of pi star zero is exactly r zero of pi star j. So this is our first equation. And then you can see that since R0 of pi star 0, pi star 0 is exactly our P14, so R0 of pi star m is also exactly just a constant sheaf on P14, which is just chi of P14 equals to 15. Okay? So this is our first calculation. We can just do the, uh, this kind of R0 by considering the first equation of the McDonald formula. So let's switch to the second equation. So what is the second equation, which is chi of R1 pi star of M of C? And now we are needs to calculate by this formula, and then we see that R1 of pi star 1 is exactly R1 of pi star J. So then we are have to like check, uh, just check the R1 pi star 1, by using the Leray spectral sequence. So remind that chi of the base space, which is our B of the R pi star, is equal to chi of our higher space, which I call it M. So then we can check by this equation that it's actually chi of uh, R zero pi star uh, M C two times because we have R0 and R2, and by Poincaré duality, they are the same, minus chi of the universal curve, C1, I believe. It's just giving you 2 times 15, which is 2 times the chi 14, minus 3 times the universal curve, because this one uh, is very easy to compute. It's negative 12. Okay? So this is how we... Uh, goes on by calculating all these kind of numbers. And you can collect all these kind of numbers and place them in the polynomial I have written. So it's 15 y to the negative 3 minus 12 y to the negative 2 plus da 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 equals to summation of ng of y a half plus y negative a half to the power g, a uh, 2g. So then you can calculate what are all these ngs, and I'll just write down my answer right here. So, so ng, 
So N3, as our, we have our DC, is 15. And N2, when you uh, calculate this kind of coefficient, uh, is negative 102. And two, uh, N1 equals to 231. And N0 equals to uh, negative 222. So these are something just uh, coming from uh, the direct calculation, but applying this formula. But now here comes the problem because physicist says that N0 should not be this number, but rather N0 is negative 192. So what's going on in this formula? As I have already reminded you that our formula is based on the assumption that all the curves should be integral. So now here comes the non-integral part, which is that our degree four curve splits into a degree three curve and a degree one curve. So when you consider these kind of two moduli space, like degree three curve is actually a P9 and degree one curve a P2, and you calculate the Euler characteristic of this moduli space, it's exactly 30. So this discrepancy 30 is exactly coming from this degeneration. But when you do the perverse shift calculation, uh, what we can prove is that it's actually the correction uh, is coming from the de degeneration into the degree three and degree one curve. So that is the, probably uh, the main theory of this stage. But now we are going to go to even higher degree and try to prove more things. So this method now only works for degree up to five, but for degree six, we have more degenerations like uh, going into a degree four curve and two degree one curve. And now I'm not quite sure what should be the uh, thing that we should do correction in this case. Okay, so I think that's all of my presentation. Thank you.